So we're going to look at a number of scriptures this morning. And we're going to look at some verses that no doubt will be familiar to you. Um, but they are some really deep verses. Robert Frost, the author, he said, if there's no tears from the writer, there'll be no tears from the reader. If there's no surprises for the writer, there'll be no surprises for the reader. Have you guys heard that quote before? I think it applies also to pastors when they're putting together a message. If the message doesn't rock me and wow me, uh, then I sh should not be surprised if it doesn't rock you and wow you. Having said that, I just want to share that I really got rocked last night. Uh, and that's my prayer every time I'm putting a message together. You know, John said in 1 John, that which we've seen and heard, we're now declaring to you so that the joy that we feel from what's rocked us, you would have the same joy as you get rocked as well. I had to really lay on my face and even pray last night because it just felt so weighty in a good way, though. You know, as born-again believers, we, we love it. We love it. The most loving thing our Lord can do is just enter in and just rock us with his word, right? I mean, the opposite is just to end up playing church or just doing theological calisthenics when we open our Bible, right? You know, I opened my Bible. I did my chin-ups. I did my push-ups. What a good Christian am I? You know what I mean? What I want to talk about today is get filled or get foul, Get filled with the Holy Spirit or get foul. There's really, there's two choices. There is no middle ground. There's no stagnation in the walk. Similar to, as kids, we all went to the playground and, you know, remember when you were old enough and quote unquote cool enough to run up the slide or climb up the slide, you know, from the bottom up. Uh, but you ever noticed that if you tried to freeze in the middle, no matter how new your pro keds were or your converse or your pony sneakers, shout outs to those from the 80s, you know, slowly you could plant those sneakers, but they would slowly start sliding down no matter how much you called yourself standing still. What a great picture of the Christian walk. We are either climbing or we are backsliding, period. The word of God makes this clear. The Bible says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not into your own understanding. You see, we want to lean into our own understanding and figure out how you can possibly stagnate. Because there's so many things in everyday life you can stagnate in and how you can just kind of park and sit idle. But what we see the world do is not the same as what Jesus says. And what Jesus says is what Jesus says. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Jesus makes very clear there's no middle ground. There's no stagnation. It's Jesus who said, if you're not with me, you're against me. There's no middle ground. There's no middle ground like Pilate to just wash your hands in the water and say, I'm free of the blood of, of this man. There is no middle ground. Jesus said, you're for me or you're against me. We're either getting filled with the Spirit and seeking to be filled or we're allowing the space for us to start growing foul. So today's message will be called Get Filled or Get Foul, okay? Let's go to Matthew chapter 12, and let's read a very interesting set of verses. It's Matthew chapter 12, and let's start at verse 43. Matthew 12, verse 43. Jesus says, When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man. He walks through dry places, seeking rest and finding none. Then he says, I will return into my house. Underline my house. I will return into my house from where I came out. And when he, the demon, is come back, he finds it empty, underline empty, swept, and garnished in the expanded Greek translation, it says, well decorated. So he says, when an unclean spirit is gone out of a man, when a person is miraculously delivered of a demonic spirit, it says the spirit goes out, walks through, and it likens a demon's experience when not being in a host to walking through a area that is not, that's torturing, that's, that's desert, that has nothing that satisfies, a dissatisfying portion or a lot. You even see when Jesus, you know, was casting a demon out and the demons even said, you know, do not cast us out and started listing all of this, that, and a third. 
But then the demon says, I will return to my house from where I came out. I find it very interesting that the demon says, my house, my house. We're talking about a person who's been set free, but now it's saying, I'm going to go back to what's mine, right? So obviously, we're looking at the thinking uh, of, you know, the spiritual kingdom of darkness. I will go back from where I came out, and when he has come, he finds it empty, swept, and garnished. The operative word is going to be empty. So then, after finding it empty, swept, and well-decorated, verse 45, he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter in and dwell there, and the last state of that man is even worse than the first. It says, even so shall it be also unto this wicked generation. Please underline my house, please underline empty, and please underline seven. We've all heard those set of verses before, right? If you've looked at books on spiritual warfare, no doubt this along with the verses about the strong man who keeps his palace until the stronger man comes along and overpowers the strong man and then his spoils can be taken. Talking about how the enemy as the prince of this fallen world kept everything intact claiming what he felt was his until a stronger one comes, the gospel of Christ, who through the death, burial, and resurrection conquers principalities and powers, and now the kingdom of God is open, the keys have been given, where we now can lead souls to liberty in Christ, right? Interestingly, this is a parable. One rule you need to know about parables is you never develop a doctrine from a parable. Parable comes from two Greek words. It means to cast alongside. What is it? It is a spiritual meaning cast alongside a, a story. So basically, Jesus gave many parables. It's a story that has a spiritual meaning thrown alongside of it. So the key thing is you don't develop a doctrine from a parable. So you don't look at a parable where it says because this person didn't forgive, the person was thrown to the tormentors and come away and say, oh, uh, the Bible teaches the doctrine that if you don't forgive, you could be thrown in hell. You don't take a doctrine from a parable, but you can see what doctrine comes to mind from a parable. Do you guys get that? You don't take a doctrine from a parable, but you could see what doctrine is lining up with it. So clearly here we see an unclean spirit cast out. This unclean spirit is wandering around and says, I will go back. Finds it empty, swept, and garnished, and then goes and takes with him seven other spirits worse than himself, because the place is empty. The whole key to this parable is emptiness. The demon does not come back and find fullness. The demon comes back and finds emptiness. But it's an emptiness that's clean, and it's an emptiness that's well decorated. What is Jesus referring to in this? He's referring to the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel had this demonic bondage of worshiping idols. From the book of Judges in the Old Testament, all the way through the monarchy, all the way through the kings, right up until the Babylonian captivity, and then even on the other side of the Babylonian captivity, right? Reform came, and in the days of Ezra, they got back into the word of God, and there was weeping, and there was repentance. But you had reform, you had a real deliverance, but because they were not pressing to be filled with the Shekinah glory of God, what began as a miraculous deliverance, this person being delivered of a demonic spirit, of demonic bondage, write in your notes, miraculous, a real miraculous work. But because they were not pressing to continue to have the filling of God's Shekinah glory, what began as a miraculous work turned into just good routine and reform. Please notice that this demon comes back, enters in with seven spirits more wicked than himself, right? But notice it doesn't say he comes back. See, we might be able to put some distance between us and these verses if it said something like, when he came back, there was despicable evil on the walls of the house. 
When he came back, there was all types of demonic seances and all types of doorways inviting evil. When he came back, there were occultic objects in the house. Do you understand that? What's so arresting with this, please follow this, is that when he comes back, it's not because there's evil in the house. It's just because it's empty. And not just empty, empty and well-decorated. Jesus is talking to the Pharisees who were on the other side of the demonic bondage of idolatry. But because they were not pressing to Jesus, pressing to be filled with the Spirit, what began as a miraculous work turned into just well-polished routine and emptiness. It's kind of like seeing someone in military wearing the garment and you say, you know, if they have a lot of stripes and stars, it says, you know, that they, they're a decorated, you know, officer or a decorated, you know, soldier. The spirit comes back. It, there's decoration. There's accomplishment. There's, there's achievement. There's, it's well done, but it's just empty. So whenever we read the scriptures, we want to say, who's talking? Please write this down. Who's being addressed? What's it saying then? What's it saying today? Four questions to always ask whenever you're reading the scripture. In this one, who's talking? Jesus. Who's he talking to? The Pharisees, the religious leaders, Jewish religion of that day. What's he saying to them? And this is what he's saying to them. Follow this. Immediately what he's saying is, you were under the demonic bondage of idolatry, all through hundreds of years of Israel's past, through the Babylonian captivity and through the revival in the days of Ezra, you were set free. But the moment you were set free, when that evil left, there was an emptiness. Your charge was to continue to seek the fullness of God. But because you began relying on just the fact that you were clean, just the fact that you were well decorated, you, were, you mistook that. You basically made a definition of the spiritual life that is not biblical. It looks good. It looks good, but is not a biblical definition. My brothers and sisters, what's happening today is you have many Christians. Why are there so many Christians in so much demonic bondage? Let's keep it real because believers are buying into a form of Christianity that is not spelled out in the New Testament. What am I saying? It's a Christianity defined by don'ts and not defined by what you do. It's a Christianity defined by don'ts. When Jesus came, the Pharisees had developed a religion of don'ts. They measured their worth by what they didn't do. But all of what they should do, they completely left off. But it looked good. It was decorated. It was clean. Do you know they even made the tradition that you could not even kill a flea on the Sabbath day if a flea was biting your leg? Because that's hunting. And thou shalt not hunt on the Sabbath because that's work and you should do no work on the Sabbath. It looked good so they'd walk around and it was a matter of I don't kill fleas. I don't do this. I don't do that. And it was all resting in what they don't do. But what they should do they were neglecting. They were so focused on the sins of commission, the sins of committing wrong, that they forgot that the other half of our spiritual walk is the sins of omission, leaving out the things that we're commanded to do. So what Jesus is saying, again, who's talking? Who's being addressed? What's it saying then? What's it saying today? Jesus is talking. Jesus is talking to the religious leaders of that day. He's saying, you were delivered from a demonic spirit of idolatry. You had revival and were set free. But because you are not seeking to fill that emptiness, because you are resting in the decorations and the cleanliness, because you're resting in merely what you don't do, and you're not pressing for the mark, you're not pressing to be filled with the fullness of God, you're not pressing to be God imitators, seven more spirits more wicked are going to come, and the latter state of you will be worse than it was when you were worshiping idols in the Old Testament. He's referring to after the rapture of the church. Jesus said, remember, I come in the name of my Father, 
and you reject me, another one is going to come in his own name and you're going to love him. The Bible makes clear that after the rapture of the church, there will be a coming world ruler who will come and be the epitome of what the world desires to see in the arrogant, confident, you know, shark tank, you're fired, you know, uh, might is right, the law of the claw, you snooze, you lose, dog eat dog, you know, uh, uh, all of that. Drop it like it's hot. It would be the epitome of everything the world wants in a leader with the oratory ability that would make Hitler look like he wasn't even a good speaker. And the Jewish nation is going to worship him as the Messiah. It says he's going to even walk into the temple in Jerusalem and demand worship as the Messiah. And then what breaks out against the Jewish people will be like such has never happened in human history. That's what Jesus is saying to them. He's begging them now while you have this emptiness, seek the fullness. Because if you don't, you are being set up to being in a demonic bondage that would make Old Testament demonic bondage look light. Do you get that? So what's it saying to us today? What's it saying to us today is this. Remember, we don't take a doctrine from a parable. So here's some things we should not even be entertaining. Why? Because we're not taking doctrine from this parable. Can a Christian be demon-possessed? No. No, right? The Holy Spirit does not timeshare. Jesus said, if the Son has set you free, you are free indeed. Remember, that's why when you study parables, so many believers get into trouble because they're reading a parable and they start developing a systematic theology from the parable. No, you develop your systematic theology from all of the New Testament teaching. A Christian cannot be demon-possessed. So does that mean at that point we just shut the Bible and say, oh, whoa, how was church? Oh, we had a great history on Israel and Jesus gave this amazing warning. And I'm sure there was a little bit in there for me, but it was really to them. Remember, who's speaking? Who's being addressed? What's it saying then? What's it saying today? We looked at what he was saying to Israel. They were resting in a religion of don'ts. And they were resting in what they didn't do and were not pressing to be filled with the Spirit of God. What's it saying to us today? What they're saying to us today is this. We're kept by the power of God. Hebrews makes that clear. Nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. If the Son has set us free, we are free indeed. Unto him who is able to present us before the Father, unimpeachable, with joy. He's going to finish in us what he started. All of that is true. And a Christian cannot be demon-possessed. But a Christian can be demonically oppressed. You can be demonically oppressed. And this is what it's saying to me. It is saying to me that we need to watch resting in this redefinition of what Christianity is, lest we find ourselves no longer seeking the fullness of God, no longer seeking to be rocked by God in greater and greater measure, and all we're resting in now is the fact that we don't watch certain movies, we don't go certain places, we don't entertain certain jokes, uh, we don't do this, we don't do that, and all of a sudden your walk is just defined by what you don't do. The Lord has a problem with emptiness. Because emptiness is the first cousin of idleness. Would you please go to Matthew chapter 25? We're going to compare Scripture with Scripture and let Scripture illuminate and interpret Scripture. Please go to Matthew 25. Matthew 25, let's start at verse 14. It says, For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling into a far country, Jesus, leaving after the first advent, right, until the second advent when he returns. He called his own servants and delivered them his goods. And to one he gave five talents, that's a unit of currency, of money, to another two, and to another one. To every man according to his several ability, and immediately he took his journey. So the Lord, before leaving, he led captivity captive, gave gifts unto men. Every one of us has been given a ministry, every one of us has been given certain giftings, and we are to use those giftings for the furthering of the kingdom, right? It says, 
He went on his journey in verse 16. He that received the five talents, while the Lord was gone, he that received the five talents went and traded them and made them five more. He flipped the five into ten. Likewise, he that received the two, he went and flipped it into four. But he that received the one went and digged it in the earth and hid his Lord's money. Then after a long time, the Lord of those servants came and reckoned with them, meaning they all had to come give an account of what they did. The Bible makes clear in 1 Corinthians 3, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, in Romans 14, 10, that we will all give an account to the Lord Jesus Christ with what we have done with the ministry he's given to us. So in the parable, again, we don't take doctrine from a parable, but we do see how the doctrine of the Bible lines up with it. So when he returns, he reckons with each of them. And verse 20, he that received five talents came and said, he brought five more and said, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Behold, I've gained five more. His Lord said in verse 21, well done, you good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. He that had received two talents came and said, Lord, you delivered me two talents. Behold, I've gained two more. His Lord said in verse 23, well done, you good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I'll make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Do you notice that the person that turned five into 10 and the person that turned two into four both got the same well done and the same welcome into the joy of the Lord? What is this parable teaching us? Every one of us has been given different ministries. Some will stand before multitudes. Some may stand before few. Numbers and all of the outcome, that's the Lord's work. What the Lord is looking for is not the size of your ministry, but how faithful you've been with what he gave you. That's why the one that turned five into ten gets the same well done as the person that turned two into four and vice versa. But let's keep reading. Verse 24, then he which had received the one, he came and said, Lord, I knew that you are a hard man, reaping where you've not sown and gathering where you haven't strawed. Basically, you're sovereign. You don't need me. You make it rain where no one's walked. You run the show. All the stars are numbered. You don't need little old me. So what did I do? I look at this. Verse 25, I was afraid and I went and hid your talent in the earth. That's really right in your notes, an excuse. I went and hid it in the earth. Lord, here that you have is yours. Verse 26. Now, does he say, well done, thou good and faithful servant? No. He answers and he says, you wicked and slothful servant. You knew that I reap where I sowed not, and you knew that I gathered where I have not strawed. The Lord's agreeing. I am sovereign. I can make it rain with no help, and I can make the crops get, go in baskets with no one picking them. I am sovereign. Verse 27, instead of my sovereignty causing you to make excuses why you shouldn't serve, he says, actually, my sovereignty should make you want to serve even more. Verse 27, therefore, my sovereignty should therefore make you have gone and put my money to the exchangers and that at my coming, I should have received my own and with interest. Take therefore the talent from him and give it to him that has the 10 talents. And then he says this, and would you write down in your Bible, this is a law Jesus just said. You know, there's a law of sowing and reaping. Other religions want to refer to it as karma. They want to refer to it as what goes around comes around. God owns the patent on what's what. God says it's sowing and reaping. You put down grape seeds, you're going to get grapes. You put down cantaloupe, you're going to get cantaloupe. You put down thorns, you're going to get thorns. You reap what you sow. Can we please bring up the Bible verse, not the quote, but actually the verse, which is number three. Here's a law here. And let's read it first in the King James, then in the Amplified. Notice this. The one who took the talent and hid it. They took their ministry. In this parable, talents represents ministry, right? The one took five, turned it into ten. The one took two, turned it into four. The one took one and just kept it safe, right? The Lord says, you wicked and slothful servant. Do you notice he calls them wicked and lazy? But notice this, he didn't take the money and invest it in the drug game. He didn't take the money and use it to promote evil. 
He didn't even lose the money. He just kept it as it was. And look at what the Lord is saying about idleness. He calls idleness wicked and lazy. So we see the first parable that is a warning against reformed living, but not being filled with the spirit and being decorated, but empty. A lot of Christians are well decorated, but empty. They have a Christian life defined just by what they don't do. But you ask them, when's the last time you've leaned into discomfort for Jesus Christ? They have to take a long while perhaps and think about it. When's the last time you've sacrificed? No, not did, the, oh, that's along the way. Okay, that happened while you were going to work. When's the last time you intentionally left your comfort zone and sacrificed for the gospel of Jesus Christ? Oh, well, I do that at work every day. Well, atheists do that at work every day as well. For the gospel of Jesus Christ, when's the last time you leaned into discomfort? No, never mind leaning into discomfort. When's the last time you just took a full body dive into discomfort? Even leaning into discomfort scares me. Because if I lean into something, I can lean back. So I can lean on this, I can lean back. But you see, when I jump, there's, I've thrown myself, you know, I've surrendered. There, there's no pulling that back in. I can pull back a lean, right? So the first parable is a warning against emptiness. This parable is a warning against idleness. Do you see that really it's synonymous? Emptiness and idleness? And then he gives the law because the person who only had the one, look at what he says here in verse 28. Take the talent from him and give it to the one who has 10. What just happened? He turns five into 10. He turns two into four. He hides the one. He calls his idleness wicked and lazy. But again, all he did with it was kept it. He didn't, he, you would think, it would make us more comfortable. It would make our flesh more comfortable if it said he lost it. It would say, oh, I'd be bothered too. Or if he did something dirty with the money, well, I'd be bothered too. All he does is just keep it safe and doesn't use it. And the Lord actually calls that idleness wicked. And then he says, take the one from him and give it to the 110. How do you think the one who turned the five into 10 is feeling when he's already just heard, well done, enter into the joy of the Lord. He's already feeling heaven smile. And then boom, he's given another one too. He's, he's, meanwhile, he's thinking, this economy is rocking me. I've already had more than enough. I'm already happier than happy and more. And then Jesus gives a law to everyone that has more will be given like that and he will have abundance but to him that has not it will be taken away even what he has you know that is a law haven't you noticed that when you take a something as simple as a sunday sermon and you go home and you start meditating on it oh man this was all checking scripture with scripture checking your notes checking your notes Lord, this is, this is awesome. The Bereans checked everything Paul said. I'm checking everything the pastor says. Make sure it lines up. He says to him that has, more will be given. Let me just read this really quick, then we'll continue with the example. Whoever has spiritual wisdom because he is receptive to God's word, to him more will be given, and he will be richly and abundantly supplied. But Whoever does not have spiritual wisdom because he has devalued God's word, even what he has will be taken away from him. Back to the example of looking at, listening to the sermon and re-listening to it and looking at your notes. I know many of you have this testimony. You're chewing on the word. You're going home. You're reading over it. All of a sudden, you get in the car and turn on the radio. It's talking about the very topic that just rocked you the most. And then you go to work, and then screensaver. Then someone emails you, and that's a verse at the end. It's like, you know what? I think the Lord, he's speaking to me on this. Then you come to church Thursday night with a testimony all week. God has been talking to me about his love everywhere I go. What's happening? Because God sees you handling and cherishing and working with what he's given you, he starts dumping bucket more, buckets more on you. But on the flip side, what happens when you go to church, listen to the message, sleep through half of it, come in late, you're here, but you're really thinking about work. You're here, but you're really thinking about whatever else. You're kind of half here. Then two days later, someone says, how was the message? What was the message on? And you're like, oh, oh wait, hold on. I hate it when this happens. Oh, man, I think, it, I, oh, I can't believe this. I was just there. I, I was in church. Trust me. <clears throat> To him that hath not, 
Would you? I think in the world they even say, use it or lose it. Jesus is just telling you that's right here in the scripture. My brothers and sisters, whatever we don't use, we will lose. And just because you used it in 2017 does not mean you can't lose it in 2018. 2017, your systematic theology on serving in the local church raised your sharp, leak proof. You were dropping nuggets and people were like, whoa, you're going to write a book on serving? I don't know. I'm praying about it. Maybe not, though. All of a sudden now, it's as though you can't even quote a verse on serving because you, you, you used it in 2017. And that's why the Lord was just dumping more on it. But you haven't been using it in 2018. Lose it. Prayer. Oh, man, when you're studying prayer, goodness, you just have the verses and, and this and that. And it's just no doubting. And you're just not double-minded. And you're growing in abounding, faith-filled prayer. But 2018 just got a little busy. You know, we had just get a little bit of Martha in us. 2018 has not been a year of praying. And all of a sudden, all those verses that you knew so well and could even expound on in a moment's notice, you're just kind of like, uh... Asking you shall receive, you know, it's just like you draw a blank. Really, we've got it. We, it's a sobering message, y'all. We use it or we lose it. There's no such thing as just having this thing polished and just sitting on the shelf and just admiring it like a trophy collection. So we see the Lord just singled out emptiness. Now we see the Lord singled out idleness. And what did he call idleness? Wicked and lazy. Now, let's go to Mark chapter 11. And maybe you'll see more of why I spent a considerable time on my face yesterday because it was like, Lord, whoa, whoa. But praise God and amen. The most loving thing God can do to us is open the full counsel of his word to us. It's the most loving thing he could do. Mark 11 and let's go to verse 12. And on the next day, when they were come from Bethany, Jesus was hungry. And seeing a fig tree afar off having leaves, he came to it. If haply he might find anything thereon. He saw this fully mature tree, leaves mature, and is thinking he would go to be able to find something to eat. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves. For the time of figs was not yet. And Jesus answered and said unto it, No man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever. And his disciples heard it. Would you please go to verse now 20? And in the morning as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter, calling to remembrance, said to the master, Behold, the fig tree that you cursed is withered away. We've just looked at a parable that underscored emptiness as a dangerous thing. But it's not an emptiness with empty and void of the Shekinah glory and the depths in God and evil on the walls. It's a, it's a clean religious emptiness. The first parable warns against a clean religious emptiness. It looks good to man. It, it's sound doctrinally. There's no no-nos in sight, but it's just religious decoration. That's the first parable. The second one is pointing out idleness. Not losing it. Not, well, Lord, I took your money. and I, no, no, just idleness, doing nothing. But again, it's not doing bad. It's just doing nothing. You see, Jesus came and found that they had made a religion of don'ts. The church today is leaning in and resting in a religion of don'ts and not focusing on the do's. The Philippian jailer, what must I do? The Ethiopian eunuch, what must I do? You don't hear that much today. What can I do? What must I do? It's just, what should I not do? First parable, the danger of empty religious cleanliness. Looks good, but it's empty of the Shekinah glory and the seeking the fullness of God. The second parable, the danger of idleness, which he calls wicked and lazy. But notice, the person had sound doctrine, though. 
The person didn't come up and was found, you know, reading, you know, Hardy Boys Mysteries. Person, hey, yo, I've been meditating on your sovereignty. The person came theologically accurate. We can be theologically accurate and quote stuff and have read the latest stuff, but if we're idle, the Lord calls that wicked and lazy. The last story is fruitlessness. He curses a tree because it's not bearing fruit. Do we see emptiness, idleness, fruitlessness? Here's the thing. It would feel better to our flesh if it said he cursed it because it was bringing forth poisonous figs. It wasn't bringing forth poisonous figs. It just wasn't bringing forth fruit. Remember this, we don't honor the bumblebee just because it doesn't sting folks. We honor the bumblebee because of what it does. It makes honey. We don't love a garden just because weeds aren't growing there. We love a garden because of the fruit it produces. You see how easy it is to settle for a Christianity where it's just it's because of the negatives that I don't do, that that is what defines us? When that's just the 101 level, that's just the beginning of the journey. It's what we do for the Lord. Would you please bring up the quote? Alexander McLaren, who actually had a tremendous influence on Warren Wearsby, I'd recommend you read anything you find by him. Look at this quote. How many there are whose one great satisfaction is in the fact that they're doing no harm. They are living in daily expectation of growing a pair of wings because there's so many ugly things that they do not do. Next quote. The list of the sins of which they are not guilty would make a small dictionary. But the list of the burdens they are carrying, of the useful tasks they are undertaking for others, this would be so small that it would be an utter blank. My brothers and sisters, we are to be Jesus imitators. You like sum up the message, preacher man, sum it up like this. Let's imitate Jesus. Fruit bearing, serving, laying down his life and serving. The father works, I work. What the words the father says, I say. We see Jesus serving. Read the gospel of Mark. I would recommend every person here. Read the Gospel of Mark and note all of the different scenarios Jesus is serving in. Jesus is seeking to imitate the Father so closely that he will not let anything stop his looking to have the heart of the Father. We see Christ serving in people's homes. How many Christians are there that won't go to someone else's house? I'll see you at church. We see Jesus serving before the sun rose, getting up a great while and praying. It says they brought everyone who had a demon spirit to him, and the house was so packed, people that wanted to get into him had to rip the roof off to lower down, you know, a crippled friend. He served when he was overwhelmed. And so overwhelmed and so busy was his day that he could sleep on a boat in the middle of a storm. We see him serving when he goes to the wilderness to mourn because he just found out that his cousin, John the Baptist, had been beheaded. Well, I'm mourning now. But he looks at the multitude and his insides twist with pain because he sees they, they're sheep with no shepherd. And the disciples say, Lord, let's just send them home. And he says, no, sit them down. We see the Lord serving when he was overwhelmed with sorrow. Some would even call it depression. We see the Lord serving even when betrayed. The Lord was seeking to imitate the Father and to be wherever the Father was, and no circumstance could stop him. Depression could not stop him. Sorrow could not stop him. Being overwhelmed could not stop him. Being tired could not stop him. Being misunderstood could not stop him. Being forsaken by friends could not stop him. Nothing could stop him from seeking to be close to the Father. Meanwhile, you had the Pharisees that had all the religious decorations, 
but emptiness, idleness, and fruitlessness. Luke 19, 13, Jesus said, Occupy till I return. We're called to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58 says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know your labor is not in vain for the Lord. Colossians chapter 4, verse 17 Paul says, and say to Archippus, see that you fulfill the ministry that you fulfilled, that you've received of the Lord. Every one of us has been given a ministry. What are we doing with it? My prayer is that this message does the same thing to you that it does to me, that it rattles your cage and literally leaves you feeling there's no other option but to seek Jesus every day, to read his word every day, to meditate on everything you read every day, and to imitate him in serving others any place, time, and wherever. We have been given what's called the unspeakable gift of Jesus Christ dying for us. Paul said, the love of Christ compels me to do what I do. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5.14, the love that Jesus showed for me in dying for me and continues to show me is what drives me to do all that I do. I don't know where we are on the eschatological timeline. I don't know what inning of the game it is. But I do know and agree with Paul when he said, the night is far spent, the day is at hand. I do know that we are closer to the Lord's appearing than we were 10 minutes ago, than we were yesterday. My brothers and sisters, again, a Christian, no, Christian cannot be demon-possessed. Rest in that. You can have a dream tonight that you were demon-possessed. Running up walls, forked tongue, running across maybe even this room. You could wake up the next morning and laugh because it can't happen to a Christian. You can have a dream you were burning in hell. Wake up. Whew. Praise God for the gospel. <laughs> Woke up a little sweaty, but <laughs> that ain't happening <laughs> because we're born again believers. However, the Bible says that the devil has wiles. Ephesians 6.11, be on guard against the wiles, the strategies of the enemy. Paul is telling believers, you know, you can't be demonized, but there is a devil who seeks to steal, kill, and destroy. He can't take your life because you belong to Jesus now, but he could take your testimony. He could take your joy. He could take your peace. He could take your zeal. He could take your passion for Christ. He could take your, 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 your laser beam focus on the gospel. He could take that. Ephesians 6.11 says he has strategy. 2 Corinthians 2.11 says he has devices. This parable is giving us what we see in Matthew 12. It's showing us devices. One, the devil's a liar. He, he really thinks that when he had us on his leash before we found Christ, that he could still get you when he wants you. I mean, wouldn't it be like comforting to think that, oh yeah, when you got saved, whatever demonic spirits were influencing you, well, see, when you got saved, you know, they had uh, uh, bandanas tied around their eyes and all of them were spun around and then, you know, sent off in different directions, like pin the tail. They don't know who you are anymore. Don't you realize the same temptations, the same lusts, the same ways the enemy would come at you? The enemy still has all of our license plate number. That's why it's interesting that even in that parable, here's a spirit cast out, but it's trying to come back to where it was before. Know this, that a Christian cannot be demon-possessed, but a Christian can be oppressed. What did Peter say to Ananias and Sapphira when they lied about the money in the early church? Why did you let the devil, what, fill your heart? A Christian can have their heart filled by the devil and be the devil's puppet without even being demon-possessed. So my brothers and sisters, let's wrap this message up. We just received 
a really sobering lesson on, on the danger of religious emptiness. Staying away from all of the wrong things and not also making sure that we're pursuing all the things we should be doing as well. We just received a sobering message on idleness. Not losing it, not even disrespecting it, just not using what the Lord gave us. Then we see the sobering message on fruitlessness. Looking mature. Jesus would not have walked over to the tree if the leaves, I've grown fig trees. When the leaves are yay big, you know it's just a little sapling. The leaves look mature. We need to beware of the danger of looking like mature believers, but we don't bear fruit. And there's a lot of that in the church today. Gives off the look of I'm a mature believer, but there's no fruit there. There's nothing for anyone to come and pluck. We should be those, my brothers and sisters, that when you walk down the street, there's such a distinction about you that people that are needy and on skid row, they feel drawn to come to you because they don't know what's going on. They don't understand, but they know that they see fruit on that tree. We need to beware it says we're in the world and not of the world. We quote that all the time, right? That means that we go into the rat race, but we're not of the rat race. I don't know if Christians today could say that too much. I think when Christians go to work that they are in the rat race and they are of the rat race. We're to be a people of distinction. Can Christ count on you to get on your knees in Center City and pray with a homeless person? Even while you look all corporate and cool and savvy? Can he count on you to be a fool for him and get on your knees and pray with a person? Looking like a total idiot, quote, unquote. And knowing that people are walking by, <laughs> idiot. Just when I thought the person was savvy, Brooks Brothers shoes, Brooks Brothers shirt, just when I thought it was one of us, one of them freaks. Are you willing to do that for Jesus Christ? Who do we really want to look like? Do we want to look like the world? Do we want to look like Jesus or do we want to look like just who we think is the successful Christian in the world? And I think that's another problem, but that's another message. Let's do this now. And I will tell you what this is doing with me. This is making me look at what have I lost by not using it? Oh, I could rehearse lots of testimonies of when I've had and the Lord has added to it, right? Right? Have and he's added, have and he's added. But I'd rather focus on what have I lost by not using it? And I want to look at all the different categories. What have I lost because I haven't used it? What has been given to someone else that was entrusted to me because I didn't use it? It's very easy to be decorated, fruitless Christians that give off the leaves that say, I'm maturity. So how do we sum this up again? And I'll get out of your way. This will be my third and final closing. <laughs> Serve. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Serve. This is a call to service. Serve ye the Lord Jesus Christ. The Pharisees just listened to a lot of sermons and memorized a lot of theology. He said, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. Serve ye the Lord Jesus Christ. Be instant in season and out of season. That means wherever you are, at any place, at any time, it's to have the heart to serve. But then let's go back to that law again. Can you bring up the quote? But you're also tapping into the greatest adventure ever because he said, whoever has, more will be given. It says somewhere else in the Bible, delight yourself in the Lord and he'll give you the desires of your heart. So you're running hard for the Lord, but you're like, you know what, Lord? I'm really tired. You will sleep better being tired for Jesus than you will being well-rested and lazy in your theology. Doesn't make sense to the natural mind, but that's the law. Jesus said that's the law of the kingdom. Whoever has will be given more. To whoever does not have, it will be taken away what you have. What this message should do for all of us is maybe it should speak to 
why there's a lack of joy, why there's a lack of peace. Excuses maybe you've been making about serving and getting involved. It should speak to that. Jesus said the kingdom of God does not come with observation. There is an element of this that you will only get and abound when you give yourself through and through. So, I don't want to run on emptiness. I'm born again. I'm sealed with the Holy Spirit of God. And if you're born again, you are Ephesians 1.13, sealed with the Holy Spirit. You are his. The Holy Spirit means ownership. The Holy Spirit means that you are his possession. The Holy Spirit is the engagement ring. But just like a, a gal can look at the ring and say, you know, uh, my, my man is coming for me. The Holy Spirit is how we know the Lord is coming back for us. But we can be sealed, but still be running on emptiness. That's why it says in Ephesians 5.18, please write this down, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be ye being filled with the Holy Spirit. I'll tell you this, when I first got saved, I, I wasn't going to wait until I saw the ministry that just had Aaron Campbell written all over it. Sometimes we could be that way. We come to church, and it's like until the bulletin literally has your name on it, like this is the ministry for you. Please report after service. Foot rub, brownies, and gourmet coffee will fill you in. We're so glad you're here. Oh, oh good. Finally. <laughs> Finally, Lord. That was, that, that, I wasn't waiting for that. When I got in church, when I first got saved, I just started asking the Lord, what can I do? Signed up to be an usher. They didn't get back to me soon enough. So what did I do? Leave churches? No. Get mad? No. I just did something else in the meantime, saying, God, you'll control when that happens. I went and asked, can I come early and clean the bathrooms? Well, on Saturday, you know, Sunday, can I come Saturdays and clean the bathrooms? Went and bought my own cleaning supplies. Drive in there, man, I'm going to clean the house of the Lord. They don't have to open up for me. I got my own bag. Went in there, clean. The more muck I found in those bathrooms, the happier I got. No one knew. No one saw. Even the pastor of the church didn't even know what I was doing. Then I said, can I get Bible verses, print them out, laminate them, and hang them up in the bathroom so when people are washing their hands, they could actually see a verse and be encouraged? Well, I don't know. We haven't checked out. No, never mind. I was just asking. I just thought it'd be a creative thing. My brothers and sisters, we find our joy in serving the Lord. A lot of people backslide. A lot of people backslide and get yoked back up into the devil because they're not busy. Yes, an idle mind is the devil's workshop. And I want to tell you, if you live all day in current events, The Economist, The Wall Street Journal, People Magazine, Facebook, Netflix, and all of that, that's an idle mind, and you are begging for the devil to put a move on you that you will not soon forget. But it's called a sleeper hold. You usually don't even know until you've done been asleep for 10 years. For your own sake, brothers and sisters, get busy for the kingdom. And not for me. I could be gone in 10 minutes. Maybe this is my last message and the Lord's going to call me home for Jesus. Because it's the safest place for you to be. It says when King David was home, he should have been out there in that battle on the front lines. When he was home, he went on his roof and saw a woman washing naked on the other roof, fell into adultery. We're, it's dangerous when we're not on the front lines getting dirty. It's dangerous. Get dirty. Get dirty. Get busy. Let's repent of idleness. Let's repent of emptiness. Let's repent of resting in leaves that scream maturity when there's no supernatural fruit. A lot of believers are walking away from the church, changing religions. I'm a Hebrew Israelite. I'm Islam. All of this and that. Why? Not because this isn't true, because they weren't using what they had and they ended up losing it. You can't lose your salvation, but you could lose everything you held dear and it doesn't even wow you anymore. So you start thinking, instead of realizing it's you, you start thinking it's this, so you go to another religion. When someone changes religions, let me tell you, that didn't happen over a week. That happened over years of not enjoying Jesus. That happened over years of resting in leaves and not fruit. That happened over years of being idle. But meanwhile... Knowing the attributes of God, books to recommend, and all of that. Amen? So let's have the worship team come up. And my brothers and sisters, you know, what do we do with a message like this? I pray I delivered it correctly. And I will tell you, I literally was on my face, on the rug, 
My dear sister Jennifer Blevins shot me a text. We were talking yesterday. I said, just pray for me. I'm just on my face, just like said to my wife. I'm just on my face, you know? All I could do is just pray. So what do we do with a message like this now? What, what do we do? Hopefully, if there's anyone here and you've been struggling in your walk, yes, there's a cross to bear and there is tribulation. But if you're struggling in your walk and struggling in the joy of Christ, you need to look at, are you in your word? Are you seeking Jesus' face? Are you serving by coming to church? Are you coming to small group? Are you coming to Thursday study? Because he said the law is if you don't use it, you'll lose it. So for anyone here, if it's kind of sporadic attendance, sometimes in, sometimes out, what you need to look at is not whether Jesus is real or not. Are you keeping it real for Jesus or not? But it should be a liberating message because now you should realize, wait a sec, it's good. All I have to do is use everything I have. Use every opportunity to serve. Use every opportunity I can to meditate on the word. Use every opportunity to repent when I make a mistake. All I got to do is use it and he'll add to it. That's why you ever notice the more you repent, your repentance gets better. The more you pray, your prayer gets better. The more you forgive folk, your forgiveness gets better. The more you serve, the more you develop an eye to serve. It is so true. Whatever you do for the Lord, you get better at it the more you do it. But the more you don't, you get worse at it. It'd be like a ball player who used to have the crazy crossover on the court, and he goes back on the court trying to cross a person up and well, he's, oh, only one problem. You were really good at it last year. You just haven't done it in a long time. Amen? This is where I want to end. Let's go to Mark 11. And let's start at verse 20, and then I'm out of your way. It's my fourth and final closing. <laughs> Mark 11, verse 20. In the morning as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. Peter called the remembrance of... And said to him, Master, behold, the fig tree which you cursed is withered away. Jesus answered and said this. Look at this. Maybe you're sitting here today and you're like, you know what? This hit me right between the eyes because I am withered. I have been fruitless. I have been resting in a, 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 a fruitless idol Christianity and thinking that just because I don't do certain no-nos that that means I'm living the victorious life. What do I do now? Peter said, look at this. This is where we have to finish because we got to end it on the gospel and what the gospel means for the believer, right? Physicians don't just diagnose, they give remedies. So look at this. He says, look, here's the tree withered away. Maybe you today say, man, that's me. What do we do? Look at what Jesus says. Does he say, well, rip it up and throw it away. Rip it up and burn it. If that was the case, then I'd be like, oh, gosh. For those that aren't there yet, you'd be like, okay, I'm watching out for that. But for those that are there, you'd be like, oh, I guess I'm just going to go home and just curl up on the couch and cry my eyes out, right? He says, look at this. No matter where you are today, would you read this with me? Those four words. Jesus answered and said to them, have faith in God. For I say unto you that whoever will say to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and will not doubt in his heart, but will believe that those things that he says will come to pass, underline this, he will have whatsoever he says. Therefore, I say to you, whatever you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will. Wherever you are today, are you ready for this? Have faith in God. Withered life, be thou removed and cast into the sea. Demonically oppressed life, now I know where all that depression's been coming from. Now I know where my giant pity parties have been coming from. Now I know where this sanctified selfishness that I've been living for too long is coming from. All of it be cast into the sea and believe in your heart and God will make you so new right now. And now, isn't that the way you want to end a message like this? Lord, I've fallen and I can't get up. I'm idle, I'm withered, I'm empty, but I look real good. 
I don't want to stand in front of you right now. Could you wait 10 more minutes? Because, Lord, I want to take this song and get my heart right. Have faith in God. And would you let the Lord make you new? Would you pray the Lord makes all of us new? And then what do we do? Use everything you got. You got time? Use it for the kingdom. You got time? Get on your knees. Imitate Jesus. Serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Serve in your local church. Ask, how can I help? What needs to be done? Or just notice and get in the game. Amen? Father, we just thank you for this message today, Lord. And would you, Lord, rescue us all from parts of our heart that have developed what we can call a sanctified selfishness where I'm okay, the world's going to hell in a handbasket, but I'm good and I'm so glad I'm in Christ. When Jesus, you lived the very different life. Lord, would you give us your eyes, your heart, your mind? Would you, Lord, give us a passion to treasure everything that we receive from above? to treasure every opportunity that we can serve you and to serve one another. Lord, we just thank you for this time, Lord, and I don't know how else to pray. Lord, would you receive this offering as service to you, Lord? May it be used for your kingdom to, Lord, explode more and more through this local church. Thank you for letting us work with you. We love you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's worship the Lord.